All right, welcome everyone to the Internet of Water Peer to Peer Network webinar series. Today we're doing something a little different than our usual webinar format. We're hosting an in depth two part practical workshop series on tools to work with geospatial hydrologic data via web services. So, like I said, this is a two part series. This week we're going to focus on R, and next week at the same day and time, uh, so Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. We'll have a second part of this workshop, which will focus on Python. Um, so if you're interested in learning some of the same concepts um, and practical applications um, that we're going to be introducing today, um, but you're more of a Python user, go ahead and register for the workshop next week. All right. So my name is Lucas Stevens. I'm a policy associate at the Nicholas Institute at Duke University, and I'm your host for the workshop today. Uh, the workshop will cover a suite of free and open source geospatial water data access and manipulation tools in the R programming language. Our presenters will give an overview of packages and their capabilities using some specific examples as context and background. So there's also going to be a hands-on opportunity to use the packages for sample applications and to interact with the package authors who are our presenters today and next week. Um, and so our presenters, we have Mike Johnson from Linker. We'll be doing most of the talking today about the R packages. And Mark Weber from the US EPA, who's here to answer questions and help out. And then Tara Changini from the University of Houston, who will be mainly presenting next week about Python. Um, so I'll hand it over to Mike in just a minute. Uh, I just want to go over a few housekeeping details first. So we are recording the presentation today, and the recording in the workshop materials will be available soon as links on our website. So if you have if you have to leave early for any reason, or if you want to share the presentation with friends and colleagues, and please do, it will be available later for you as a link on our website. Um, Following the presentation and during it, we'll have some time for our presenters to answer your questions. Um, so please submit these at any time into the Q&A box, and we'll try to get to them as they come up, since, since this is more of a practical tutorial. Um, if there are a whole lot of questions, we might save some of them for the end, um, just so that we, we can get through the material. If you have any administrative issues, uh, for example, if the audio or if the video isn't working, you can put these in the chat box and we'll try to get those fixed as soon as possible. Okay, so with that, I'm going to exit out of my sharing and I will hand it over to Mike to get us started with these geospatial hydrological tools in R. Awesome, yeah, thanks, Lucas. Um, yeah, so I'm Mike. Um, work for a company called Linker. It's based in Boulder, Colorado. I'm happy to be here today. Um, so we'll dive right in because we've got probably more material than we'll cover anyway, but the idea is you'll have resources to look at um, down the road, depending on how in-depth those material you want to get. Um, the main repository is IOW's Internet of Water 2022 underscore R. Um, I can stick that in the chat box for everyone who has it. Um, Actually, I don't see the chat to the whole group. Maybe Lucas, if you wouldn't mind doing that, I'll put it to us here. Cool. And on this main repo page, you'll find the link to the workshop. The main slides are at this here um, hyperlink and some extra material if you're interested in going farther into it. You can get to the main slides um, just up in the about section there. So we'll go ahead and, and dive right in. Um, the purpose of this hybrid workshop is to kind of introduce um, some basic spatial data foundations. So what is it that you're getting when you access a lot of these packages and what do the web service themselves really rely on? Section two, we're going to talk about some specific R packages that are unique um, to the earth systems and hydrology um, kind of research fields. Section three is going to be how do you actually access web data when there's not a service? So section two is about these packages that have been built around services. Um, making our lives a little bit easier. Section three is what happens with all of the data in the world that a service hasn't been wrapped for us and we have to do a little bit more of the heavy lifting. And then if time um, permits, we'll get into this hands-on example at the end here. Um, this hands-on example is really cool because next week Tahar will kind of present a, the, the same example using the Python packages and workflows and we'll see the similarities between the two languages. 
Um, so then we can get, get right into it. I'm not 100% sure how familiar the audience is with R and R Studio. So we're gonna give just a quick um, background. This will be enough to get you going if you haven't used it before, but we're not gonna dwell on it too much. Um, there is a link here for how to install R and R Studio if you're on a Mac or on a Windows machine. You can follow the directions there. Um, in general, when we talk about R packages, these are snippets of code, documentation, data that users have put together and compiled in a, in a consistent way that R knows how to download and interpret. So R packages are extensions to the base language that you might get if you just installed R following the directions here. Um, and a lot of these packages come from CRANs. I think this is the comprehensive repository for some. It's a, a centralized repository that has a lot of rules and conditions that you need to meet in order to get your packages there. So it's a hurdle for package authors, but it does assure some level of consistency and, and um, confidence in the packages you download. A lot of other packages that we might want aren't on CRAN because of some of those hurdles or they're in development or you want the latest and greatest. For those, you generally go to GitHub to find some authors can host their code on GitHub. You can't, there's no base function to install packages um, from GitHub. So you need this package called remotes and within remotes, there's a function called uh, install GitHub. And all you need to list there is the username and the repository you wanna download. That'll install all the files and make them accessible uh, within your working environment. Any working sessions you have, so anytime you start R Studio or R, you will want to load the packages you're going to use. Packages are loaded into a working session by calling library. So if you call library remotes, you would have access to the functions within the remote library, including install GitHub. You don't always need to attach these libraries. We'll see a few examples there, but it's a generally convenience to make sure that the data, documentation, and code available um, is easy for you to, to find and use. And then once package is attached, so once you call the library and kind of attach those functions and data and code to your, your working session, you're free to use any of the objects and functions within it. So when we talk about functions, these are just code snippets that are either used um, for either very common or complex tasks. So they're things that um, it's nice to have some rep um, repetition for. Um, so that's really all a function is, is you're calling a set of directions to run on a set of inputs. Um, these functions are distributed in the packages that we've talked about. If you see this syntax here, it's telling you what the package is. So if you see remotes install GitHub, you know on the left side of the colon colon, that's the package the function's coming from. On the right left, right hand side is the function name itself and anything in parentheses are the parameters passed to it. So as we go through some examples, if you forget what package we're talking about, I've tried to use that syntax to make sure that we can see what package and what functions we're calling. Um, but you don't need this colon colon syntax if you've attached it to your working session. Um, the example that we see right here is if you call SF, it's one of the packages we'll talk about today, and then read SF, you're going to call that particular function from that package. Anytime you have any questions about these functions, um, you can put it in your console, put in your working session, run this line of code. So as long as the function name is preceded by a question mark, you'll get some help pages showing up in the lower console of our studio or your terminal, wherever you're, you're running these things. So there is a way to go back and kind of refresh on these after we talk about them. One thing we'll see a lot today are these comments. So anytime a line is preceded by a hashtag, it's not code that's actually run by the machine. It's there for us as humans to read. Anything that doesn't have that comment back um, hashtag preceding it, it'll run as code. So in this place, two plus two is four. Um, and so that's kind of the basics on R that we'll go into. Um, hopefully it's enough to kind of get us all on, on a good page. Um, but if there's more questions about it, some of the resources on that, that main page here can be useful for getting up and running. So today we really want to talk about spatial data and how we interact with it within R. And we're going to discuss two different types. And if you're familiar with GIS, you've probably seen these two different types before. One of them is vector data. So these are points, lines, and polygons that describe discrete features um, in the real world. Um, so points represent a particular area. Lines represent the area interpolated between points and polygons represent areas. And the second one is raster data, which says there's space is continuous and we're going to discretize it or break it up into a number of equal sized or rectilinear units. These units are often called pixels or cells and these cells have a resolution depending on how big it is. So if you hear about a 30 meter land cover data set saying it's splitting up space into continuous 30 meter by 30 meter squares and assigning one value for each of those. And so you'll see this in satellite imagery, land cover data, weather data, climate data. Um, pretty much anything that you're representing as a continuous phenomenon is distributed as raster form. 
So those are the two types that we'll talk about at different times today. I just want to draw our attention to the fact that given this is a joint R and Python two-week kind of workshop, that a lot of what we're doing, what we're talking about is founded or grounded, I guess, in these common communities, libraries, and standards. So the spatial community at, at large um, is built by a few key organizing committees. One of them is OSGEO, Open Source Geo, and one's OGC. These organizations are intended to build out standards, um, best practices, and even software in the case of OSGEO. And there's a few core libraries that you're going to see pop up today um, that drive every spatial software and spatial package you use, whether it's R, Python, QGIS, ArcMap. They're all grounded in these libraries that are called Proj, Geos, and Geo. Proj is dealing with projections and transformations. So anytime you want to represent spatial data, whether it's vector or raster, you need to place it somewhere with some reference system. So anytime we unfold a 3D globe, try to place it on 2D map or 2D screen, we need to have a projection or a transformation to do that. GEO stands for the Open Source Geometry Engine. So it's a little mixed up in their acronym, but this is all of the things that you can ask about geometry. So how much, how much area does a polygon cover? How long is a line? How much distance is it between two points? Do these two lines touch? Are there two points within 10 kilometers of each other? All those type of geometry operations, whether you're calling them a QGIS, ArcMap R, or Python next week are driven by this open source geometry engine. And then one of the biggest is GDAL, which is the Geodata Abstraction Library. So you might see all these different file formats out in the world, NetCDF, TIFF, um, you know, HDF, uh, NetCDF4, uh, JPEG, PNG, all of these different file formats can be read into a common data model. So that's the geographic data abstraction library. It's abstracting all of these different data types into a common data model that we can use. So when we talk about these processes today of dealing with raster or vector data, it doesn't matter whether we read vector data from a geo package or a shape file, or whether we read raster data from a net CDF or a TIFF file, because everything's grounded in this common um, data abstraction layer, we can work with them in the same way. And all that heavy lifting is handled by these underlying libraries. When we talk about vector data, one of the common or, or I guess the most prevalent data models for it, it's, um, an OGC and an international organization standard, it's called the simple features model. This is the one that says how we deal with and represent and store um, vector data in databases. Everything within the simple features model is built on the points. Collections of points can define line strings, lines define line strings. Polygons are defined by linear rings, so lines that close. It's a lot of good information online, and we can talk about it later about how the simple features model is actually put into place. But the key is because it's an international standard, it doesn't matter what platform software you're using, this is generally the way that your vector data is going to be represented. Everything is a point, a line, or a polygon, and there's collections of those that can work in different ways to define a geometry. And all geometries have to be placed in the, in the digital environment in some way using the spatial reference system. When you see spatial reference system, you might see SRS, CRS, that's coordinate reference system. They're all kind of defining the same thing um, about how you represent these geometries defined by an X, Y um, with relation to some origin and some, some unit system. So the reason we went in a bit to what simple features model is and why it's important to us is the core package in R that we're going to use is called SF, right? And the SF stands for simple features. And if you look at the SF documentation, it says it supports, it provides support for simple features and a standard, standardized way to encode spatial vector data within R. So it's using this common standard, saying the way that R interprets bits and bytes of data in our computer is, is unique in some senses. So we're going to make sure that we have an R-based way of kind of complying with this general standard. And if you read farther into it, you'll notice that it says it binds to GDAL for reading and writing data, to GEOS for geomet geometrical operations, and for PROJ for projection conversions and data transformations. And so while SF is unique to R, it's an R package, you can only use it within the R environment. This idea that all spatial software binds to these three libraries to do the operations and the things we want is consistent across everything. So next week when Tahir talks, you'll see the packages in, in Python are doing the exact same thing, binding to these lower level C libraries so that you can operate um, on spatial data in the way that the language you're using kind of interprets things. Just to show this, if you wanted to use SF, you would first have to install the package. I've commented it out because it's already been installed. You only want to install a package once or when you're updating it. 
But after that, we're attaching the package SF for working session so that we have access to the functions within it. One of the first ones we'll look at right now is just what external software versions are we binding to? And we'll see that we have Geos 3.10, GDAL 3.4, Proj 8.2. The versions aren't particularly important for our discussion today, but I just want to kind of bring home the point that any language we're talking about is dealing with common um, spatial operations. When we look at how SF works within the R environments, if you're familiar with R a little bit, this package you call DBI, which is your database interfaces. So whether you have an SQLite database or you have an arrow table or you have an Athena table up on AWS, you can, you can just sync SF with these different database and interfaces. SF works nice with the tidyverse. So if you've heard of the fire, um, tidy R, any of those, SF is intended to work really well with these, which we'll talk about in just a bit. STARS is the simple feature version of working with raster data. We're not going to cover STARS. There's 150 packages that depend on SF. SF works with units, which we'll see a little bit today, and LWGOM, you know, don't need to worry about this one here. And then critically, SF, anytime you install SF, it's coming with these pre-compiled GDAL, GEOS, PROJ, and different C libraries that are allowing you to work with those, those values. So within R, when we're talking about this, the, we mentioned that SF and R is the way to encode data within kind of R's view of the world to make sure we can run operations against the, the international standard right so if you've used r before you know data frames are a huge thing with it the flyer has been built around these to filter select mutate group by these common kind of data science practices on data frames what sf was done and what's pretty novel about sf is it extended the list um, structure within r to make sure that it can encode these different geometries so you're encoding each of these geometries as a list object, right? A line is a collection of points. Many XY points make up a line string. Those XY pairs can be defined as a list. And if you have a list of lists, this fits nicely within the data frame context and allows you to store geometry in conjunction with the data frame. And if we look at what a simple feature object is, it is just a data frame with some spatial information. It's a simple feature collection. Multi-polygons are one of the different geometries that we can see here. So it's just a collection of polygons, right? Multi-polygon is an extension of polygons, storing many of them together. It has some geometry type, the one we just looked at, has some dimension. These points don't have a third dimension or a measure dimension. So all the points making up the polygons are an X, Y. Has some bounding box, so some coverage that it has. It has that EPSG spatial reference system. Spatial reference systems, again, are these key parts that tell us how these geometries fit within the real world. They can be represented as prod strings. They can be represented as EPSG codes. We're not going to go into that too much today, but there is a projection associated with these geometries that we see. And the key part then is that R kind of started or is really based on this idea of tidy data. Every row is an observation. Every column is an attribute of that observation. When we look at the simple feature model, simple feature standard says, Every entity in the world that we're representing is a single object or a single feature. And that feature idea fits really nice with the observation idea and allows us to start storing information and geometries in conjunction with each other and taking advantage of all the nice spatial properties that these spatial libraries provide us, as well as the data science principle that R provides in packages like the tidyverse and dplyr. We're going to look at basic use of SF, right? We might have spatial data sitting on our, on our laptop might be a shape file, it might be a geo package, it might be something else. All we have to do is define where that package lives. So here we're using um, a file that's associated with the SF package. It doesn't really matter how you get this. The file name is the path on your, your working system. As long as you have some path, some file that can be interpreted by GDAL, all you need to do is say read SF, and you'll read that file name in, in this case, this NC shape file into an object that R knows how to work with. Anytime you read an object in with read SF, it reads it in into this structure that we had just described. So when we look at this NC object that we just read in from this NC shape file, we'll see it has some attributes to it, areas, perimeters, county IDs, fifth codes, but it also has this geometry. And once this geometry is added to the data frame structure, we're able to do things with it like plot variables against the geometry, right? So here we're taking this variable SID 79, I think this is like some death rate thing in 1979. I don't really know what the variable is, but we're plotting it against the geometry stored in NC. NC is, of course, North Carolina. So we can see these are the values per geometry for North Carolina. 
We not only can do things like map and plot, we can do cool things like spatial measures. When we talk about geos, it's giving us the ability to estimate lengths, areas, and things based off the coordinate reference system. So if we asked for the ST area of our NC object and just looked at the first few, we would see the first geometry there, um, Ash County has me measures or a unit of or a square um, area in meters of this large number. The second feature has it of this number. Here we're seeing this units. I don't want to go into this today. We don't have time, but units are a key part of all spatial information. And if you're curious in it, you'll have noted that SF binds to the units li library, which is an extension of the C and C++ UD units. So any hydrologic model, any um, kind of code that you're working with in other environments is generally using this units for unit conversions of things. Those are applicable in R as well because of the binding of the SF library. But we can do other things besides just asking for measures, right? So this is saying what's the area of this, but we can also say union those North Carolina objects, right? And we'll see when we plot that, we dissolved all the interior boundaries. We can also ask for centroids of geometries, right? So this is saying take that North Carolina polygons, find the centroid, and go ahead and plot those in red on top of that union file. All right, so this is getting into more about GIS and the things we do with simple features. That's not going to be the topic of today. We want to make sure that there's an understanding that simple features are driving a lot of what we're seeing, and a lot of that GIS geometry type work is available in that SF package. The other cool thing that we talked about, right, is we're not just getting geometries out of this, we're getting geometries associated with the data frame type object. So we have the ability to do data science operations on the attribute space of the simple features object. So we can do things like let's say, hey, take the top 10 areas and map them as red. Take the top five areas and overlay them in yellow. Take the top one area and overlay it in green. So right, slice max is just a, a range and a filter, so right? A range based on area, take the top 10 or top five or top three. It's these SQL deep fire type interfaces. Again, not the main topic of the day, but it's really important to know that these simple feature objects allow you to extend anything you know about the data science world of R, anything you know about geometry operations and post gists and any of that, and start using them together. Um, so that kind of covers the. Yeah. Mike, sorry, this is David. Sorry to interrupt you. We yeah. had a request. Um, is it possible to make your screen larger at all? Some folks Let's are having a hard time. See, how's that? Is that a little better? Yeah, that looks a little better. It's still it's cropped somehow. I don't know if it's able if you're able to go with a more full screen. That's a little better there. That's yeah. better. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Sorry yeah, for the interruption. Yeah. No worries. So that, that's the gist of what I really want to get into about vector data. So now we're going to do kind of the same thing with raster data before we jump into the packages that leverage these for you can do your own type of, of work. So when we talk about raster data within, within R, um, SF is kind of the leading package for vector data, and Terra is the new-ish new comer on the block. It's replacing the raster package, and it provides kind of the lower-level raster-based functionalities as well as some nice higher-level implementations that allow you to do global, local, local operations, if you've heard of, of raster data before. So it builds on raster and provides all these nice things. As you get more into raster, there's predict and interpolate methods. So you can do a lot of interpolation um, prediction using some machine learning algorithms and things like that. So it's a very um, deep package. Um, we're really just going to be using it for the basics, you know, read data, crop data, mask data. But there's a whole lot of information that can be delving into if you're interested in raster data. So a lot like SF, Terra also links to GDAL. Unfortunately, it's not necessarily the same version of GDAL, so it's something to keep in mind. Like SF, Terra comes with a compiled version of GDAL. This makes our lives a lot easier that we don't have to manage the C libraries, but on occasion, it can cause conflicts. If you want Terra, same way as SF, go ahead and install it. This will get the version from CRAN. Attach Terra to your working session. If you immediately call GDAL, you can see what version of GDAL you're binding to. So in this case, it's 3.42. And if you want to look at the drivers within GDAL, like in the drivers of the types of data that it knows how to read, we'll see that we have 214 different types of data that GDAL knows how to abstract in this common format. So it doesn't matter if you're reading ARC info grids, ARC binary grids, this is Xavier raster grid format, but symmetry attributed grid, Magellan Tobe, I mean, most of these you'll, you'll never see, but you can always bring them into the same format within R. If you wanted to look at HDF, and these are how modus data usually come, 
HDF4, HDF4 image, HDF5, all of them will be reared into the same spat, ra spat raster object that we're going to see in just a moment. Basic use of Terra is not all that much different than we saw with SF, as long as you can define a file path. Last time we used an example file that came with SF, this time it's an example file that comes with the Terra package. It doesn't matter where that file path comes from, as long as it's a path on your machine. And unlike SF, where it was read underscore SF, to read in a raster object, it's the function is called rest. If you call rest on a file path, you'll get this object that's called a spat raster, right? So spat raster is an S4 class that has the name of spat raster. And we're not going to go too much into raster data at large conceptually today, but any raster is made up of a number of sets, rows, and columns. So that's the matrix of values. Those values are associated with a grid. That grid has a resolution. That resolution of that grid sits in some, um, some unit system. So here we can see this data we read in has 115 rows, 80 columns, only one dimension. So if you had a raster stack through time, you might have 12 if you had monthly values. And we know these 40, val these 40 values in the resolution are in the units of meters based off of our coordinate reference system. This data was sourced from this file called news tiff. News tiff is the one that we called. So we are linked to the correct uh, information. And it has some summary statistics about what we actually see, right? So the minimum value across this matrix is 138, and the maximum is 1,736. One important thing to know about Terra, um, unlike SF, Terra creates C pointers to objects. So you don't actually pull data into your working environment until you're ready to use it. So even though you've attached to the system, you know metadata about it, you actually haven't necessarily pulled this data into memory that you can start working on it until you call operations um, on that specific data set. So this is really important when you're dealing with large imagery data, CONUS-wide um, model prediction, things like that. You can make connections to really big data without actually calling it all into memory and, and destroying your, your working session. The last one we want to talk about is just because we we're, we're going to see it today is called map view. It's a package um, that it uses a leaflet backend to quickly map information. So here we can install map view. We load map view in our working session and just call map view on some simple feature object. We can plot things as well. So today we're going to make maps with the examples we see using map view. Map view is a convenience function written over leaflet to make these really quick um, and iterative maps. The cool thing is that together, SF, Terra, and Map, you provide a lot of the functionality you needed to get the best of your programming environment, but also kind of a GUI driven GIS. So you can look at your data quickly, you can explore, you can click on it, you can look at the information about each of the features, but you can also do these things in a programmatic open source way that allows you to kind of run the same analysis many times for different places, um, different, different analysis and different studies. So with that, I think that covers really the spatial data foundations. Everything we're going to be doing both this week and, and next week are really driven off of these underlying core libraries, driven by open source communities. Um, and that, that's what we're going to be leveraging. So section two here is going into a number of packages. You can see them here that provide nice utilities um, for quickly working with spatial information and getting it into your working environment. The workshop. Um, today, up until section four, really isn't about what we do with this data. It's just how do we get the data that we want quickly into a working session for that we can answer questions we might have. have. Um, and in light of that, we've kind of tried to make the examples as general as possible. So they're hopefully going to kind of prompt your imagination in ways that you could use these workflows in your own, um, own jobs, own research. Um, but I guess without kind of showing a really in-depth detail. Uh, that really only works for one, one example. So AOI is the first package. We're going to show it is not on CRAN and it provides interfaces for geocoding and retrieving spatial boundaries. So say you want Colorado, Brazil, uh, Larimer County, Colorado, you can quickly pull these boundaries um, into your working session without defining it. The reason we're starting with this one is a lot of the web service data that we're dealing with. The whole premise of web services is that you can store huge amounts of data on one computer somewhere remotely, and people can pick and choose the subsets they want and stream those subsets over the internet. If you can't define the area that you want as your subset, it makes these tasks a lot harder. So AOI is nice in the sense that it gives you common, I guess, concrete boundaries that you can then request from these larger data sets. So if we look at a couple of examples here, 
We use remotes to install this package from GitHub. We attach it to our working session. And we can ask for things like go ahead and get the state boundary for Colorado and throw that on the map, right? We're saying AOI get is the function from AOI. The parameter we're filling in is called state. The state that we want is Colorado. This will return a simple features object because these are vector data. And we immediately pass that vector data to map view. You'll see this pipe um, today. All that it's saying is take the object on the left-hand side and pass it to the first argument of the function on the right hand side. So up here, when we said map view NC, we could say NC pipe into map view, and it just places that NC object as the first, first object. So when we do that, we see that we do in fact get a nice outline of Colorado. The work is we expected. Let's say you wanted an outline of Tuscaloosa County in Alabama, kind of same thing. This time you have to provide the state. So the state's Alabama, the county's Tuscaloosa. You get the nice boundary returned from it. You can do the same thing for countries. So say you want Ukraine and throw that on a map, you get a spatial object representing that. And you also have some geocoding capabilities. Let's say you want to know the lat long location represented as a point for the National Water Center for NOAA. You just geocode National Water Center. This gives you a lat long. You tell it you want this lat long represented as a spatial point, and you can get that on a map. So if you, any of you have ever been down there, right, it's right along the Black Warrior River, sits on the University of Alabama campus, we got a good geocode, things are nice. This is all driven by OpenStreetMaps, and they're as good as the information that's been digitized in that place, but it's all free, open, you don't have to pay API fees like with Google. Uh, so it fits nicely within the context of what we're trying to talk about today. So again, AOI, it's, it's a straightforward package. You're getting boundaries that allow you to say, this is the area that I'm interested in data for. If you want Temperature for Colorado, you start by saying, hey, give me an outline of Colorado, and we'll pass that off to get temperature data. And that, that's kind of a workflow we'll see as we go today. One of the first packages then that we want to talk about in terms of actually getting data is called NHD Plus Tools. So this is a USGS package um, that's really built around working with the NHD, so the National Hydrography Data Set. Anytime you see the Blue Line River Network of the country, that's the NHD Plus, as well as the NHD data model. Um, so the package, kind of like Terra, is, is a really deep package. It's being used to regenerate a lot of hydrofabric work for USGS and NOAA um, modeling efforts of the National Water Model and the RMS national implementation USGS has. So it has a lot of different functionalities that are outside the scope of web services. So a lot of those include data access from local databases, indexing and nat network navigation along the NHD data model, um, network navigation specifically in attribute space rather than geometry space and network attributes. If you click on any of these, you can see the functions or even help pages. But the one we're focused on today is data discovery and subsetting. So, like the packages before, right, you have to install the packages. This time we want to install NHD plus tools. The most stable version is on CRAN, but you could also get the development version from GitHub. This is where we can start getting differences in the way we might install things. And if we look within NHD plus tools, we're first going to look at all the functions that provide some Git capability. So if we look at all of the functions available in NHD plus tools that start with Git underscore, you can see there's at least 41. And in some of these, we'll notice there's Git Huck8 or Git NHD plus or Git NHD area, um, Git NWIS. So there's a lot of these different variables that deal with spatial data and getting it for a known location. And so those are the ones that we want to focus on. For, for today, because I think they, they provide a nice, a nice example of where web services can really be useful if you've ever tried to work with the NHD+. It's a multi-gigabyte database that kind of chokes if you try to open it in, in a system. It comes as a geodatabase um, ArcMap file. So there's a lot of challenges with working with those national, national files. So the basic use we want to show here is starting to kind of align NHD with NHD+, or AOI with NHD+. Is we say let's make an empty list we're going to call this empty list boston and so lists in r are just things that we can populate with information the first element we want to add to that list is called aoi and we're going to get an aoi for boston right so this is defining that area that we want um, as what openstreetmap considers boston we then can run a series of these different functions right so nhd plus get water bodies get endless get hot spots they all have the same signature and they're all populating new elements within this Boston list um, element. You ran this chunk of code, you would then look at how many features are in each of these. 
So for the Boston area, we have one AOI. That makes sense. It's a polygon defining Boston. There's 201 flow line features, 58 water bodies, nine different inlet gauges, and 18 huck 12s. And each of these are coming from these functions that have the same signature get something. And you're going to get that something for a defined area. So this is a pattern we're going to see as we get more into these other examples. And if we put that Boston list into map view, we'll see that these are the things we, we call, right? We turn on and off our AOI, that's the area surrounding Boston. We turn on and on in HD plus, we see the flow lines are coming on and off. Water bodies, same thing. Gauges, same thing. Huck 12, same thing. So this whole list here runs in a couple of seconds, giving you all the spatial information subset from national databases ready to use for the analysis that you want. One of the things about get in HD plus, right? When we called it here, we asked for the default, which is to return flow lines. In HD plus kind of conforms to this OGC standard called high features that says different catchment objects or different hydrologic entities can be realized in a number of ways. If you work with the NHD plus, you'll know that there's generally a flow line in the catchment for each hydrologic area. We're calling these realizations. You can ask NHD plus specifically for any realization outlet, flow line, catchment, or all. And this is the data that you pull back. So here is another example. If we say get in HD plus, so we're calling this function from NHD tools for the area of Boulder with the realizations of all, we'll see that the Boulder object that we get back has catchments, flow lines, and outlets. And within that view, we can look at all of these individually. So we're not going to go in today too much of what you can do with this information, what you have it, but rather um, just the fact that you can retrieve it. Data to retrieval is the next one that we want to talk about. It works in a lot of the same way. We can combine it with these data that we've seen before. The two basic use cases in data retrieval we want to talk about are how to get time series information from observation or from gauges, and how we can use its client, the network link data index, to pull information in a different way than we've seen above. So flow line information and linked data information. So again, have to install the package, attach it to your working session. What um, read invoice daily values. So read from invoice daily values. Again, you have to look at the help pages to find these functions, which you'll become familiar with them pretty quick. To read information, you have to have a site ID. Fortunately, we had a lot of site IDs from the Boston gauges that we pulled above. So here we had these nine different gauges. We want to pull stream flow information from them. So we pass those nine site IDs to our site value. And the parameter code is a little bit tricky to find. You can find it within the data retrieval data object called parameter code file. And each of these parameter codes is specific to the type of measure that's being observed by the gauge. So one of the ones you'll probably want to memorize if you're doing hydrology is 0060 is the parameter code for stream flow. So all we're doing here is saying asking or we're asking for stream flow for all nine gauges that we found within Boston. Some of them might have stream flow, some of them might not. We're using this web service to pull this data in. We're saving as an object called flows. And if we go ahead and map flows with X or time on the X index and flow on the Y, we'll see we were able to find information for four out of the nine gauges. The other five didn't report stream flow information. They're probably um, coastal or, or down for, for whatever reason. But quickly within one line of code, we were able to get full time series range from 1940 to 2020 for four areas or four gauges within the Boston area. So it's a pretty cool example of quickly finding the gauges and the site IDs we want, getting the time series information, and getting it onto a map. What you do with this information afterwards um, is really up to your expertise and your, your areas of interest. The second part of data retrieval that we want to highlight is that it has a new client for the network link data index. The network link data index is a system that says Entities in the world, like stream gauges, water quality sites, um, dams, can be linked to the flow line network. And we can do things like say, what is the upstream river network of a location of interest and find all the USGS gauges along it. So the NLDI service requires three general um, inputs or parameters, somewhere to start. You can look at get in all the I sources to find these different places to start. So you can start from a California stream gauge. You can start from a GFB 11 POI. You can start from a HUC 12 core points. You can start from an NWIS site. But typically, you're going to be starting from COM ID NWIS or water quality points or a spatial location. So these are direct inputs you can use. The second is a direction to navigate along the network. 
So once you have a known starting point, do you want to go along the upper main stem? Do you want to go along the upper tributary? Do you want to go down along the main stem? Or do you want to go up downward across the network along the downward divergences? And then the last thing is what do you want to find along the way? So say you started a COM ID, you want to trace the upstream basin. What do you want to find? Do you want to find endless groundwater sites? Do you want to find endless gauges? Do you want to find flow lines? Do you want to find catchment boundaries? And all of these are findable along the network. So if we look at a basic use for it, the function signature again is called find in LBI. The hardest part with this is generally finding the function name. The help pages are useful for that. We can say to get an object called in LBI, we want to start a COM ID 101. So COM ID 101 is just the first indexed um, NHD flow line. It's in Texas. We want to navigate along the upper tributary. So we're not just going up along the main stem, we're going across the entire upper tributary network. We want to find flow lines in with sites and the overall basin. And we want to traverse the network 1,000 kilometers upstream. So either go 1,000 kilometers and stop or go until you hit a headwater. This again takes a few seconds to run and the returned object is another list. This time there's one object for origin. That's COM ID 101, where did you start? We asked for the basin, so we see the basin object. We found 28 national or inwis sites along the upper tributary and 1800 flow lines along the upper tributary. And so if we flew that on the map or throw that into a map view, we can see that we have our upstream basin. We have the upstream inwis sites that we found. We have the upstream flow lines. And we have the place that we started, which is COM ID 101. So again, the key ones that you can start with, you don't have to start a COM ID. You can start at a location. So pass it an SF point or pass it a water quality portal site or pass it in with site ID. There's a lot of different ways you can start a navigation. You just have to define where to start, where you want to go, and what you want to pull out of it. So, so far, we've seen AOI for boundaries, NHD plus tools for pulling data from the USGS web server. We've seen data retrieval for pulling time series information based off IDs that we can find with NHD plus tools. We've seen an NLDI client for finding locations and tracing upstream to cut out different watersheds and different areas of interest. And now we're interested in NWM tools. Okay. So data retrieval is providing time series observations for, I guess, for areas that are observed. But they're becoming online a lot more information that um, is simulated and modeled. And one of those is NOAA's National Water Model. And NOAA has run a retrospective study for each of the three releases of the model that it has. And these are terabytes of data because of the model structure and the way where Hydro runs. Each hour in model output is one file. So if you wanted to get one year of time series, you'd have to download however many hours there are in a year, 8,000 something. Get each of those files, open them up, and pull out the single value that you want. So NWM Tools is working on making that process a little bit easier. Again, you download it, um, and I would note as well that this, this was a project that was funded by Quasi, um, and so it's, it's getting a little bit of community support, which is, is really nice to see. Um, so the library, again, we're going to attach the NWM tool, making sure all the functions and objects are available to us. And we're going to start with that 10th identifier. I, I don't know why I picked 10, just pick 10. But right, we asked the NLDI for these 28 different sites. Let's go ahead and pick the 10th one of them. We're going to pull some endless data using data retrieval. So these are the observed values. And then we're going to pull some model national water model data for the COM ID associated with that endless site. All right, so this might take a little bit to look at, but we have this NLDI object and we found the upper tributary endless sites. Each of those endless sites has the USGS identifier. The USGS identifier can be passed to data retrieval. That upstream endless site also has its indexed COM ID. That COM ID can be passed to read NWM data. Combined, these both give us the information that we need to view these different data. So this is returning a 42-year hourly time series in a few seconds for the COM ID that you asked for. A lot of times, hours are a bit too much. So we provide a bunch of aggregation functions. You can aggregate hourly data to day of water year, to Julian dates, to month. You can aggregate the record based off your own summary function. You can aggregate the seasons um, and so on. So here we're just showing a few examples of we pulled in the data. We get a, a daily mean. So we get a mean over the year, month, and day. Here we're getting a seasonal um, value. Here we can pass a, a user defined function. So if you want the 75th percentile of the seasonal flows, can aggregate it as such. 
You can pass multiple functions as well. So aggregate monthly to a mean and a max, and you can plot those in different ways. Again, NWM tools is saying there's, there's valuable model data out there. Hasn't really been evaluated too much because it's difficult to use. I'm just providing the first instance to be able to get time series information for these model points and link them and compare them to observed values. Running a little bit short on time, so we're going to go through these last ones pretty quick because I think three is, is of the most interest um, remaining. Elevator is another package. It provides some services to Amazon's tiles, to open topography tiles, to USGS's elevation point query. It follows the exact same syntax that we've seen before. Download the package, link it to your working session, find the correct function. Again, the help pages are a good place to find these. Pass it in AOI, and this time we want to pass it the basin of this request we made before. So we made this request for this upstream basin. We have an NLDI object that has one basin. In this case, we want to get the elevation for this watershed. And we can do so by passing that basin as our AOI and defining the zoom level. You have to read a little about the zoom level. These are leaflet tile maps, so the zoom level that you have is the resolution of the cells that you're interested in. Um, it's, it's tricky to pick a zoom level. And that's why we'll talk about other elevation data sets in a bit. But the idea, pull in that information, run your function, and you have elevation data for that upstream basin. Again, I, I want to acknowledge finding these functions and committing them to memory and using them takes practice and repetition. What I'm hoping that we see is we haven't written much code, right? In order to get this information, you would have to remember find an LDI, map it upstream, you get a basin and throw that basin into another function and you have your elevation for the upstream area of a location of interest. OpenDAP catalog is a new, very experimental package, but I think it's one that is, I, I'm pretty excited about. It allows us to get climate data from many different endpoints and the endpoints can be OpenDAP catalogs or they can be virtual raster systems or, or VRT files. Again, download it. This is not a CRAN package. You get it remotely from GitHub, attach it. And we're going to see exactly how, how this meets some, some unique pro, uh, challenges we've had, had at NOAA at least. So here, let's say we're interested in Florida, right? You can put any AOI you want to be any state, any county, any country, um, any point. You're just defining an AOI. There's this function called DAP, which is DAP at, or data access protocol that says, given a URL, so the URL lives somewhere out in the world, and an AOI and a desired time slice, go ahead and go subset this data for this AOI in this time. It establishes your connection to this thread server. It's going to pull information for precipitation, rain rate, maximum monthly temperatures, monthly at tem maximum temperatures, monthly minimum temperatures, and wind speeds, right? So there's six different variables that sit within this single resource. The area that we asked for, right? So the state of Florida covers 63 rows, 48 cells, and one time slice, right? We only ask for one month period within this entire data set. The data set has a resolution, has some extent, and has a coordinate reference system. In total, there are 18,000 values covering the state of Florida for these six variables. DAP goes and gets that data for you and pulls it into a spat raster, right? So if we look at what DAP actually comes with, we'll see there are six different objects in it, one for each of the variables that we've seen, and we can plot those. So the best part about this is if you know a URL, you can go find the information for any AOI and any um, date. And this syntax works for any thread server that you can find online. The known challenge of this is it's really hard to find these different thread servers, right? So what we've done is we've indexed up to this point 14,000 of them, right? So we have 14,000 of these different data sets that you can access. You can search them and look at them and see that what, what's within them. 14,000 is notably too many for individuals to go ahead and look through. So we have some natural language searching on it. Say you want to know what data you have for daily precipitation. You search this catalog for daily precipitation and you see there's 10 different data sets that provide that, right? So the malware data set provides um, LWE thickness of precipitation. Uh, Daynet 4 provides precipitation. Chirps provide precipitation. Um, different versions of chirps do this as well in different ways, and Vic provides some. If you wanted to narrow your search down, you could say, okay, search for daily remit precipitation. So remit is one of many data sets. Now your search has been reduced. It's only returning one of these elements. We're calling this particular element, right, everything that's in this is a catalog element. 
So you no longer need to know the URL to every endpoint. You can search for the particular variable and resource that you want. You can actually pass that catalog element to DAP. So instead of saying, go get this data from the URL, you say, go get this from the catalog element. Again, for a particular area defined by an AOI for a given start date and given end date. In this case, we're going to go out and get that precipitation value from GridNet. This time we see there are over 1 million values that we're gathering for this 18-day um, period. Uh, this period that we're looking at is Hurricane Harvey. So we want to look over Texas and Louisiana, full 18 days of rainfall information. And we can see when we plot it that we actually start picking up that hurricane, right? The hurricane's coming in, you're getting some rainfall all of a sudden starts to make landfall around Houston and it just sits there for a few days on end. So it made the Harvey so, so devastating from my understanding. We can actually start getting this within the data. It doesn't matter what analysis you wants to run, you now have that data applicable. All you needed to do was search for a grid for precipitation data set that you want, define your spatial bounds with AOI and define the date period that you want. DAP goes ahead and takes care of the lifting of pulling these million values into your working session, but you can plot, summarize, and do whatever you want with them. Um, one thing to be aware of that's really nice is there's a lot of data sets that are tiled either in space and time, like MODIS gives you open DAP thread points for tiles. So there's like 14 of them that cover the US and a lot of data sets give you tiled in time. They say there's a retrospective summary of 2001 and past, and then everything from 2001 and forward is based off climate projections. So there are two different data sets, even though they're representing the same spatial area. Um, DAP takes care of a lot of that too. So in this case, we're looking for MODIS PET for the state of Florida for the month of January. There are three different MODIS tiles that cover Florida. It takes care of all the cropping mosaic and bringing these together for you. Because you have one call across multiple data sets, it distributes that call and brings it in in your, your data format that we now know is GDAL driven. Zonal, I'm not going to get in too much because we are a little short on time. Basic usage is if you have raster data and you have vector data, you can go ahead and summarize based off the function you want. Based off, So this is saying summarize the Harvey rainfall data or the Harvey counties for each county, find the total precipitation for that day and index it based off zip codes. And that allows us to start looking at county-based averages. And you can also pass um, any of these, right? Mean, median, mode, sum, product, standard deviation, minimum, uh, minority, fractions, weighted means, varieties. So there are different summary functions that you can have within this. And general takes care of the efficient processing of that information. And then the last bit that I want to talk about is all those packages that we've seen are, are services, services of services, or rely on web services. But in a lot of cases, the data that we want isn't actually um, wrapped up in a nice service. So that means we have to go figure out how to get this data into our working session ourselves. Um, a lot of times, you can go download the file and use read SF and RAS to do that, but that can get cumbersome, especially when data size starts to grow. When we talk about the national water model data, you don't want to download 80 gigabytes of data to get a time series for one point. So the ones that we're going to talk about today, there's three of them. How do we access tables? How do we access raster data? And how do we access vector data from online resources that don't have a package or a service wrap form? Tables and CSV values are actually one of the easiest. There's many different CSV readers within R um, that allow you to do this. So there's base read CSV reader has a read CSV data table, has a free, uh, an F read service that will read from a URL. So really this one's pretty straightforward. You attach any of these libraries that you want. There's not really one that's better than the other. They each serve their purpose. And as long as you know where a CSV file lives online, you can go ahead and read that directly into your session. The challenge here is because somebody isn't wrapping this for you, you often run into oddities in the way the data is formatted. So the Army Corps has gone and put all of the dams in the National Inventory of Dams in a CSV file. That CSV file is accessible through a URL, but they put in this top line, you know, US Army Corps, right? And that's the first row of like your Excel sheet and then the data falls below it. So if you read it in, the default of a CSV read would say that's your header and everything else is data that associates to that header. So we're just saying we read it in once, we see that doesn't look like we're gonna ask to skip the first line and then we're actually getting a clean table of data. So it takes a little bit of experimentation, but readily, even though there's no client written around the NID available in R, and Tara will show that there is one in Python, the CSV file lives online. We can read it directly, and with a little bit of trial and error, 
we can get that 92,000 dams into our working session almost instantly. Raster data and vector data are a little bit more interesting. Again, we fall back on GDAL, right? Everything we've looked at is GDAL, GEOS, and fraud driven. GDAL has what they call virtual file system drivers. So these are, and VSI is what they, what they acronym them as. So they're ways to access data that lives online and allows GDAL to read them as if they were local files. There's a bunch of different VSI extensions that you can use, VSI zip, Perl, and S3. Um, these are three that I typically use, so I think they're ones to highlight, but there are more that you can find within the help pages. VSI zip is saying if you have a zip file that lives somewhere, how do you first in, in, in web space unzip it and access files that live within that zip file? VSI curl is a generic file system handler for data that doesn't have any authentication. VSI S3 is the virtual system for S3 buckets. So if you have some data in an Amazon S3 bucket like USGS is moving over to, you can access that information with VSI S3. Basic usage, it's really, it's really straightforward once you see the pattern. Here we know there's some data that lives on Duke's server for Polaris soil, right? So they have a VRT of Polaris soil. We want to access it directly within R. All we have to do is prefix that URL with VSI curl, right? So we're going to use our generic file system handler, tell GDAL there's some data here that we want to read, and it reads directly into memory. DAP works nicely with these as well. So if you want to crop it to a particular area and not deal with projections and everything, you can pass that same URL with an AOI and go ahead and plot it. So here we're saying go ahead and go get all the soils data for Larimer County. Um, and we have that data now in memory to work with. We just had to find that BRT. These Polaris ones and these elevation data sets are all discoverable in that open DAP catalog as well using the search function. Putting this together a little bit, why might we care about this? What kind of questions can we answer quickly? Well, let's say we wanted to know the river trend or the river profile of the area that drains to the USGS building in Fort Collins. All right, we can put some of this together by saying, you know, let's use the NLDI service. Let's define the location as that USGS building. So we're going to geo, geo code the USGS address. We're going to ask for the upper main stem, and we're going to ask to find the flow lines in the basins. Right? This is where the USGS building sits. This is the river that drains to it, and this is the contributing catchment area. Right? That's nice. We got that quickly from data retrieval. We know there's elevation data set that sits out on open topography. Right? And again, these are discoverable in that search catalog. So if you search for elevation, you'll get these different options. Right? Go ahead and say this data lives online. We want to access it remotely. There's no authentication needed, so we're going to use BSI curl. And we're going to ask to crop it to the AOI that we're interested in. That returns elevation for this basin because this is the basin we pass as the AOI. You can do some cool things with it then and say, hey, take that elevation data and extract the values along the upper, upper main stem flow lines. So we don't need to go into much here. We're unioning all those flow lines into one object. That union is that um, spatial function we saw at the beginning. Go ahead and do that and assign an ID to it, and then go ahead and map it. So here we're actually seeing all of the individual points that make up this main stem. We're extracting an elevation data from a 30 meter raster, and we're able to plot it from the headwaters to the tailwaters in the city. Right, so this is just plotting. You don't really need that. In three lines of code, we're able to take a quick profile of, of the main river system for the area that we're interested in. And then last one, we're right at 12, so I'll, I'll wrap it up. A lot of spatial data, particularly shape files, and particularly those distributed by the Census Bureau, come as zipped archives. Right, if you work with shape files, they're generally five file archives. They are zipped and then put on an FTP server somewhere. This makes our lives a little more complicated, but it's not something we can't deal with. All right, so if we go look at the FTP server for Tiger Road lines, right? Say that's something you're interested in. You would see that the pattern is Tiger lines, five-digit bit code um, roads. So if you wanted the road lines for Tuscaloosa County, right? We'd start with an AOI, get Tuscaloosa County in Alabama, define the pattern that that FTP server has. So it's Tiger lines 2021 for a bit code of interest underscore roads. And then we need to define the way of opening that zip file and extracting the shape file, right? So zip file, and then we want to read from the shape file. But it's nice that we can pair these things together. And again, this just takes some time to look at. This in between the brackets here is the URL 
to the zip file, right? So at HTTPS, census gov, geotiger, tiger 21 roads, there's a zip file. We're going to use VSI curl to access that zip file. So our generic file handler gives us access to that zip file. We then want to unzip and look at one particular object within that zip file, and that's the, the shape file. So outside of that bracket, we're going to put at the end of our backslash that that same file, so that same pattern, exists with the shape file extension. So by curling and unzipping this within the URL, we're able to quickly read all of the rows within Alabama in a couple seconds. The last key point that I want to make is we talked about everything is based off GDAL, Geos, and Fraud. We've talked about simple features. Remember, Terra does have vector support. Simple features is nicer from a data science perspective. But because Terra is driven by GDAL and anything GDAL based can read these VSI commands, as long as we pass that same URL to the Terra version of read a, a vector data set, we get the same information. And then I guess, yeah, totally the last thing, and then I'll end is because it's an internet of water one, they're building this GeoConnects interface or infrastructure that provides persistent identifiers to a lot of hydrologic relevant features. By becoming a persistent identifier, you're prescribing a URI or a uniform resource identifier, a permanent URL pretty much for each of these features. And as long as you can build out the URLs for each of these features, read SF, TerraVect will read them directly. So again, you don't need to have a web service built around these. You don't have to have a fancy package. As long as you can build up the URL patterns yourself, you can work with this data directly. And then I'd like to point here, it's hard to go in this example, we certainly don't have time, but this is a more complex and concrete example of how do you answer questions like what are the stream flow impacts of wind dams are, are put into place. So within this, we use Texas as our example. We read data from URLs, we read data from data retrieval. We do some spatial processing on them to find those that are close to each other. We hydrolink them using the NLDI saying, where do these dams actually exist in reference to upstream um, flow networks of the stream gauges? We filter them down. We can plot and evaluate them. So we pull out information, we pull these different time series, we look at when the dam was developed, and we can find that some of them have notable stream flow pattern deviations from the point that the dam was, in, was built. You take one of those in particular, you can start using um, the NLDI, NHD plus, DAP, start answering questions like, oh, what are the land cover influences up and upstream and downstream of where these dams were built? And you can come to nice conclusion, even in this somewhat contrived example that, you know, in the upper tributary, you lost a whole lot of herbaceous lands. In the downstream area, you gained a whole lot of cultivated crops. So there's some some logic here that this dam was built to build agricultural land downstream of where these dams were built. So hopefully with that, I mean, that's a ton of information. Um, I hope it was useful for you guys and I'm happy to stick around for any questions. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Mike. That was, that was a lot of very you know, useful information. Um, so we're going to, we're going to take, I think we can take about like five minutes for any questions from the audience. Um, I don't see any right now, but I have a question about sort of the sort of like the the state of data within the United States right now. How much? I mean, so you work with this kind of data on a daily basis in your own work and in your own research, right? Yeah. And how much of the data that you need and that you regularly use is available like this through web services or through these various packages? And how much do you have to go sort of search and download and um, and transform on your own. I would, uh, so my, my day job, I, I work for NOAA's Office of Water Prediction and I'm building the hydro pattern for the version four of the national water model. So NHD plus tools, open app catalog, those are all built on the context that these are the, these are the types of workflows people need to build to be able to contribute to this open source model that NOAA, NOAA is building. So all data is open. Most of the time, it's just hard to find. And so most of these packages are, where do the services live? How do you take out some of the complexity of them or some of the repetition of defining the queries to them? And how can you then kind of move on to the more interesting stuff of like this damn question of, you know, what's the land cover difference? So I think hopefully that answers your question a bit that everything that I've needed is, is online and web available. The, the questions I generally deal with are when you're doing things at scale of CONUS and very small catchments, 
sometimes you lose efficiency doing things through web services. So in those cases, we're downloading and doing data on servers or in the cloud, but everything could be done um, with open data. Okay, great. Um, and then we have some questions about so publishing the results of these analyses. Um, it, are there easy ways to scale maps as desired and, and make them more publishable? More on like the plotting, like mm -hmm. how, how they visually look. Oh I yeah, um, yeah. The ggplot two and R. I mean, you can go down a rabbit hole. You can make absolutely beautiful graphics. Some of them, none of mine, but there's definitely like uh, Cedric. Forget his last name. Has a bunch of R based graphics that show up in Scientific America and Nature and a bunch of other places. So it, it definitely takes a. The coding's not the hard part. It's um your imagination and your your personal design aesthetic, I think, but anything's possible with the plotting packages. And this then, is Mark. I, I also mentioned uh, you might want to look at TMAP too, rather than the examples you had, Mike, which were all based on interactive, you know, mapping with MapView. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, MapView is great for quick and dirty. Just is the data where I want it? And is this look right? And am I missing things? But it's not a pretty package. Right, so it's more like a visual glimpse of the data that you've got and the analysis that you've done rather than a, the, the final, final end state of it. Yep, exactly. And in fact, they're really hard to pull out because they're HTML widgets. So they're, they're built, built for web interaction, not really for static, static viewing. And then we have a specific question. So how did you map the elevation of the stream flow line? Did you extract it from the surface elevation raster or did you use another method? Oh, yeah, yeah. so that was, um, I mean, again, there's probably, if you're doing this for research grade, not just to show applications of workflow, there's probably better ways to do this. This um, COP30 is an elevation raster that's hosted on open topography. So it's just a 30 meter raster data set. And it's saying, crop that out. So to crop that global data set to only the area that covers this basin. And then extract is a Terra function. We can fall back on, on GDAL methods. It says for any raster object, pass a, a line string, a polygon, a point over it, and extract the values under each of the nodes of that line string. So all we're doing here is the line strings are typically digitized from the point of origin up. We want to actually map it from origin down. So we're just assigning this ID of take total count of points, generate a total mount decreasing by one, and then map it along the axis. So here we'll see we have 650 some points make up this line at each of those points. A value is extracted from the cropped version of this elevation data set. And that's that's what's shown there. The blue line is just a smooth trend lined over it. And great, thanks. Okay, so I encourage everyone to go back through these links and go back through this tutorial and really explore these packages. Mike has really given us a great introduction to a lot of these different tools, but it, it seems to me that it really, a lot of this really deserves like time playing with getting data in and manipulating it um, with each specific package. Um, so thank you so much, Mike. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees. Um, and next week, same day, Tuesday, 1 p.m. Eastern, same time, we're going to have a, a follow-up part two of this workshop series, which is going to focus more on Python. And we're going to have more sort of hands-on examples, more in-depth of the hands-on examples. Um, so Absolutely. that's yeah. it today. Any final thoughts, Mike? Um, I can't find a chat to the group at large, but feel free to share my email and we can. Um, I, I'm happy to answer any questions or have any follow-up about this. So. Okay.